quite conservative oil demand uh, scenario. Now I'll show you a little, um, we have developed some oil simulation tool and that, uh, uh, that is uh, something that we, we use all the kind of wells on shale with the whole long time it takes from a kind of signal old price until you order a new uh, more rigs until the rigs come and then you have to drill and then you wait for the completion equipment uh, coming and then you have to connect the wells so the, the, the delays are quite significant but we have made this simulation on both an offshore long cycle and uh, shale short cycle and if you see um, right now that we are in oversupply uh, do I have maybe so this is where we are now, uh, getting into our supply, this orange line uh, above the demand line. The, uh, and the, the, we, will see, we will, might see a quite important reaction of oil price. This scenario is with no OPEC action after December this year. Then you will see a huge oversupply and the correction will come slow and really crash on oil price. Uh, we are indicating this down to, uh, to the 30s. We have no action, and it takes a long time before the market is reacting. But still, with shale, we think that we will see a very strong cycle going forward with still relatively long reaction because shale reacts much slower than most people think. But so that this shows also that uh, OPEC will have to uh, act very strongly next year uh, to cut even more than what they have done so far. And now back to our data on, um, on OPEC and, uh, and you know the on, only kind of voluntary actions that we are seeing in OPEC now is more or less Saudi Arabia um, with uh, friends in the Emirates and Kuwait. But if you look at um, the global supply picture, uh, you see that um, if you look at OPEC without Saudi Arabia, they, um, this is incremental supply. Uh, so you see that in general, uh, Non-OPEC is, uh, is relatively, non-OPEC outside the US shale is uh, having some ups and downs, but relatively flat. And then OPEC is regulating this, and uh, last, uh, this year we had uh, Iran and Venezuela that has contributed to a very significant drop of OPEC uh, production. Uh, meaning that uh, Saudi Arabia had to somewhat compensate, but next year there will be both strong additions from shale, uh, and also strong additions from uh, non-OPEC uh, countries like Brazil and, uh, and Norway. So Saudi Arabia, they, in, our, in our data, they will have to uh, cut by uh, minus one, mi one million barrels as compared to the production they have today in order for the market to balance uh, with, with strong additions from many countries, not only the US. Now, going and looking a little at the cash flow uh, from all the public EMP companies in the past, and you see that uh, the, the cash flow, yeah, they were quite quite good in 2011, and then costs and capex increased increased with, 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 due to service cost and and somewhat uh, over investments. Uh, the cash flows they uh, were actually low in 2014, still with very high oil prices. The average was 100 in 2014. But now the, the industry has uh, managed to, to cut costs for uh, many reasons, standardization, lean design, and lower unit costs, lower rig rates, and the cash flow was higher than ever for, for the industry in 2018, and we think it will be still relatively strong at an oil price that will uh, be around 60, maybe next year it will go a little lower, but it will stay in, in uh, around 60 and, and very healthy cash flow from the industry. And what has caused this is a reduction in, um, in uh, operational cost uh, uh, and other things as well. But looking at the uh, operational cost, we see, for instance, shale operational cost per barrel has come down from nine, and now it's it's below seven. That is all all cost, transport cost, uh, lease operating costs. But you also see that offshore and um, and uh, and also majors cost has come down very significantly. And this has caused break-even prices uh, across the board. Shale, of course, uh, from uh, hardly profitable uh, uh, in the peak uh, with break-even prices in the 80s. 
Now, uh, in average for all the plays in the US, down to four to five, if we index that to, uh, to Brent in order to compare with, uh, with the other regions. Uh, but you see offshore also very, very impressive reductions in, in break-even prices. Now, looking at um, the global investments, uh, CAPEX plus uh, XPEX, uh, XPEX is exploration uh, CAPEX. Going forward, you see that it, it's dropping from uh, $800 billion uh, to, uh, and it's flattening out around $500 billion. And if you look at the CAPEX from the non OPEC X US shale, it is still uh, at $300 billion, and that will be enough to, to balance production from the non-OPEC ex-US countries. Meaning that what we have to really follow to understand the supply uh, is to follow OPEC and follow shale. The non-OPEC ex-shale is more or less uh, flat uh, going forward uh, if they invest at, uh, at a level of $300 billion. Now, looking at approvals, uh, that is one way of replacing reserves, uh, of course, uh, is uh, to uh, always make sure that you approve as many projects as you have in, in production. And this is oil and gas combined and oil and ga uh, gas uh, production per year in terms of a billion barrels is something like around 50. So if you don't, if you don't uh, replace or approve projects with, uh, with um, uh, reserves, uh, at this level, you will not be able to replace uh, reserves. And this is, this is conventional. But look at this extreme large hole that we get from the lower oil price. And this, uh, we are uh, only replacing one third of the production uh, globally from conventional. But thanks to shale, it is not causing any problem. But as we just uh, heard also that without shale, this would have caused oil prices uh, at, at historic high as we speak today. Now looking a little uh, more at uh, non-OPEC outside the US, uh, which uh, going forward will balance at uh, almost a uh, flat level. You see that uh, this year, next year, you will have very important additions from Brazil. Brazil didn't actually add anything before 2019. That's uh, very little with uh, all the discoveries that did pre-salt. We didn't see any significant additions before very late this year, and they are coming more next year. And these FPSOs, uh, FPSOs are now very much uh, uh, already uh, on the field, so this is, is very little uncertainty here. And in, uh, in Norway, we have Johan Sverdrup ramping up. So you have uh, 700,000 barrels of, of uh, production additions from uh, the non-OPEC uh, outside the uh, US uh, next year. But going forward, uh, you will have declines and additions that will, that will more or less balance. Now looking at the global cost of supply curve. When we draw this curve five years ago, we had shale on the right side. So this was what uh, OPEC saw in 2014 and wanted to, to squeeze uh, U.S. shale out of the cost of supply curve. But what they actually did was to, to squeeze U.S. shale down the supply curve. So now we are here with U.S. shale, almost the cheapest uh, new addition that you can have in terms of um, NPVs uh, per, uh, per, uh, per well. Uh, oil sand is still uh, higher uh, than, than anything, so new projects, we think that you still need uh, higher oil prices than now in order to sanction new oil sand projects. Now looking at shale, uh, of course a lot of people are following rig counts because it's very visible. Uh, it has fallen uh, steeply, uh, almost as steep as ever, 200 rigs uh, over, a, over a year. Uh, it's it's uh, almost as quick as you can do with the contracts in place. But uh, by looking a little at where these uh, rig cons has fallen, you can see that one of the play, the Oklahoma scoop and stack, has taken most of that fall. So that's something uh, really dramatic uh, has, uh, has happened in, in that uh, play. You also see that Eagle Ford has fallen a little. But uh, so uh, if you look at Permian, Permian in, in total has stayed relatively flat. Uh, it has fallen in the Midland South. We used to split it up in four, Midland South and Midland North. Midland North was flat until just uh, six months ago. Uh, and Delaware, um, uh, Delaware, New Mexico has actually seen some increases recently. 
loyal deal over Texas was relatively flat until very recently, and it has fallen quite significantly. But rig count is one thing. It's more interesting to look at, uh, at SPUDs, the, the red line, because there is uh, drilling efficiency thanks to the pad uh, penetration. There is uh, more wells drilled per, per uh, rig now. Uh, so the SPUDs has not actually fallen, but even more important to follow production trends is the completions. And you see that differences between SPUDs and completions that uh, creates the inventory of drilled and completed uh, wells, the so-called ducks. So here, the, with more, uh, that was uh, in 2017. During the year, it was a huge build of uh, duck inventory because there were much more SPUDs and completions. Now it has more or less followed, so uh, it hasn't been a lot of changes on the duck uh, inventory uh, over the year. But spuds and completions is not the best metric either in order to figure out where production is heading. Uh, the, 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 it's better to look at how the kind of um, lateral footage drilled in the wells. And you see that here we are higher now than at the peak in 2014. But the ultimate uh, metrics on activity is how much propent uh, all the uh, producers are putting into the wells. And you see that uh, we, we have reached, I'm uh, hoping, uh, eight, nine uh, million tons per month, which is uh, far more than twice the peak levels back in 2014. Almost three times as much sand is being put into the wells today uh, as compared to the peak in 2014. And that is the best metric on activity because production is very much more correlated to how much sand you put than how many wells or, or how many rigs you are operating, of course. Now, looking at, uh, at US production, total US production, month by month changes, you see that uh, this year it has been relatively flat and that has been a lot of temporary uh, um, uh, impacts. It has been hurricanes, it has, it has been flooding in Oklahoma, so this year has been flat but the capacity has increased with all these completions. And this actually was a forecast I did uh, Thursday, uh, just before the EIA came out with the PSM for August. We forecasted 600,000. People thought we were a little optimistic with 100,000 uh, barrels increases uh, in US um, lower 48. And this was exactly what, uh, what happened. Uh, August was very strong. And we think that the rest of the year will be strong on US land. Maybe, uh, maybe uh, something like 100,000 barrels added uh, by the end of the year. Uh, and it's, uh, it, over the last three years, production has been back and loaded. Uh, both 2017 and 18, there were more production in the last half of the year than the first half of the year. And we think this will happen this year as well. Now looking at, um, at uh, which companies are uh, growing production um, most, you see that Exxon is the one that is growing more than anybody else among the majors. Uh, but Chevron also is, uh, is growing, while Shale and BP is, is not growing so much. So uh, the, the US majors are uh, taking more or less over the, the championship uh, in the basin. Uh, they will have to struggle a little to beat Pioneer, maybe, but uh, we'll see. Uh, now, uh, this is a forecast of the U.S. production, and we think that uh, the production will, uh, will grow. Uh, this is the base decline. Uh, this is um, a kind of low activity. Uh, this is a conservative activity. Uh, this is our, uh, our uh, forecasted activity going forward. Uh, it, will, uh, it, it will be possible to grow production uh, even in a quite conservative uh, estimate on activity. And uh, even with an oil price of 40, we think that production could stay flat in, in the US. Uh, already at 50, we could see production uh, growing from um, uh, something like 12 million barrels now. Uh, and uh, with, with the, our base case, we, will think, we think that crude oil and condensate can get to 20 million barrels uh, in 2030. And, yeah, and this, the, I have the one minute left. Uh, this was, I can't go back. Okay, no problem. I will show you a little animation here because this is a history of the US um, liquids uh, production. 
So uh, it was declining uh, towards, uh, this is including NGL, that's why the numbers is a little higher than what I used to see, used to see uh, and, and biofuel. So um, it was declining uh, from 10 towards, uh, towards 8 and 9 in 2006. Uh, then we started to see some, uh, some, reduction, uh, some increases. And already uh, in uh, 2014, the U.S. total supply passed that of Saudi Arabia, if you include the biofuel and, um, and the NGL. Now, this is not biofuel, it's only NGL and condensate. Then we, we saw the, the peak and then the, 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 the temporary uh, burst. And if you take this going forward, we think that um, in terms of NGL and, uh, and oil, that we could see um, uh, U.S. Um, First of all, becoming uh, completely self uh, self served with with uh, with liquids next year, but even crude oil, we think that uh, within 2025, it is possible that uh, U.S. can be self sufficient on on crude oil. Of course, still with a lot of trade, lot of imports and export because of the oil qualities, but the net crude uh, import might uh, get to to zero in 2025. I, I will just show you here uh, a little the gap on the um, on the conventional. So this is uh, this is discoveries. You see that over the last uh, ten years there uh, has been a huge um, uh, lack of replacement of um, of resource by discoveries. It was actually not very much even uh, even earlier in the um, uh, in the millennium. And it was not very good even at the peak. The, the, the companies didn't find a lot of uh, oil even at the peak, even with a lot of investments. And now it has been uh, negative for a, for a long time. And we think that uh, this will, when shale is flattening out, even we think that shale will flatten out in 2025, we think that uh, it might be some tightness in the market uh, at that time. Okay. Thank you, Chris, for keeping me on time. Eh? <laughs> Well, thanks to each of you for, for a great set of uh, presentations. Um, I would like to invite people to come to the microphone if you have questions and to give you the opportunity to get yourself up there. I'm going to take the, uh, the chair's prerogative to, uh, to, to ask a couple. Um, Chris, you presented, a, um, you presented an outlook. I know that uh, a number of your peers, you know, uh, prefer to communicate by a more of a scenario based approach and I'm just wondering how how you know Exxon Mobil perceives the value in in, in analyzing and communicating around uh, a central outlook versus a scenario based approach yeah I would actually prefer to do scenarios because then you could never be wrong See, <laughs> <laughs> no I, I think we think both are really important. Uh, you know, scenarios give you a chance to, given a, a defined endpoint, what are the different ways to get there? And, and even from a base case outlook, you can take scenarios and look at different broad assumptions, different geopolitical assumptions, and, and again, show just a range of how to get there. The, the one downside to scenarios, though, is I think sometimes we do get lost on, well, what are the assumptions that are underlying that, some that might be really, really optimistic. So we see a given scenario, wow, it looks great. I, you know, for me and my children, I want us to be on that pathway, but then you dig in and, and the assumptions underlying that aren't that realistic. And so we continue to show a base outlook because we, we do want to be, you know, you know, a bit of an independent organization that's trying to call balls and strikes on where do we think we're really headed? Mm -hmm. And I think um, Sarah Ladislaw has a great quote that I steal all the time, where the, the value is in discussing those trends. And then if you don't like the trends that you're on, well, let's talk about what are the things we can do to bend those a different way. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Um, Mark, um, given the uncertainty around the oil price environment, I'd love to hear your thoughts on, you know, if, if we were to have, say, an extra $10 a barrel up or down on the oil price, how big of an impact do you think that would have on production and investment? Well, I would, I would say on a short-term basis, um, I wouldn't predict it would have much of, a, of an impact at all. Um, I think, as I mentioned in, in my comments earlier, uh, there's a tremendous amount of expectation uh, from, from the investment community uh, that, that in, in, in higher price environments that we return more capital either in the form of higher dividends or share repurchases or special dividends 
um, to address uh, the, the higher price environment. Uh, it also depends on the curve behavior. Um, all of us would look askant at a high uh, uh, short-term price spike uh, without behavior in the curve that would really show a longer-term sustained uh, higher price. Um, if you see that, you could see some incremental growth over time um, as, as the operators adjust their model. Uh, but one of the things we have to be really careful about is uh, not driving up our break-even costs or inefficiencies uh, and, and, uh, and inappropriate increases in service costs. Um, you probably would see more hedging um, of some of the, uh, uh, some of the independents to uh, be able to lock in, uh, lock in a higher price regime if, if the forward curve is really conducive to that. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Uh, Pierre Magnus, you, you mentioned the, the ducks, and I know there's uh, a lot of debate in the industry about you know, how, how potent a potential force that is in supporting future U.S. Uh, supply increments. And so I'd be interested in your thoughts. And then, you know, Mark, if you want to jump in as, a, you know, as an operator as well, I'd be interested in your thoughts on the, the duck question. I think it's a little exaggerated, this duck uh, issue, because uh, it's just normal to have inventory. You know, when there is a, a delay between spuds and completion, there will always be inventory. And this inventory is not uh, very large uh, in terms of... Uh, and the abnormal part of that inventory uh, is probably not more than 1,000 wells or something, meaning that those wells that can be uh, completed if the company really wants to speed it up. And if everybody calls Halliburton at the same time or uh, Schlumberger, the prices will go up. So I, I think that uh, most companies uh, are a little concerned about not uh, jumping at the same time. I c completely agree. I think EIA is reporting the current duck count in the U.S. somewhere around 7,700. It's not remarkably higher than what it was about a year ago. I think the Permian is about 3,600 of that. Um, but as Permian is going to say, it's, it said it's, it's really, um, when you look at multi-well pads where you're uh, bringing on, uh, you, you drill all your wells, complete them on, and, and then bring them all on at once. There's going to be a natural inventory, and uh, the larger operators are really not running uh, their businesses today to, to complete ducks to, to be able to bring on fast production. It, again, runs away from the capital efficient model that we're all running on. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you, and thank you. Uh, I'm going to turn my attention out to the uh, to, to to you, the most important people in the room, uh, and uh, just a request: please briefly identify yourself and make your question in the form of a short question, please. This microphone was designed to make me feel short. <laughs> Marianne, you're the biggest person in the room, Ma <laughs> Madam President. My, uh, my name is Mary Ann Ka, and I'm at the Columbia Center on Global Energy Policy. And my question is for Mark, but also for the others. You know, what I hear on Wall Street is that investors are saying, tight oil is finished, there's slowing growth in IP rates, and the game is over. That, and that's, what, that's what the common perception I'm hearing. Whereas when I think about it, I think, well, you know, let's look longer term. Are there other things out there on the horizon? They may not show up in IP rates, they may show up as cost efficiencies, but automation, um, use of big data, downhaul sensors, you know, and particularly when companies like Exxon and Chevron are also jumping in who have a lot more capital. I mean, what do you all think about the future in terms of, and I won't call it productivity improvement because it may just be a cost improvement. What do you think about the future? Is, is this it or is there something brighter in the future for the, uh, the industry? Well, having been in this industry for a long time, it's, I, I, I think, We've called an called a uh, an, an end uh, to to future development and future uh, technology and innovation, and it never happens. And I think that's ultimately the punchline answer to your question. Um, looking at uh, diminishing increases in IP rates is really not the way that that you should look at the at the shale manufacturing business. Um, as I mentioned in my talks. There, we do see a di diminishing marginal return on productivity. That doesn't mean that the economics on these wells uh, aren't compelling for companies like uh, Exxon or Chevron or us. And, and so there's still a significant amount of inventory left. And it's highly economic when you look at the break-even. So even on today's technology, 
uh, there's a significant amount of inventory left when you look at the Permian Basin and you look at our break-evens. In terms of future uh, development, uh, there's, there's still a significant amount of oil in place uh, and there's still significant opportunities to either re-enter uh, existing well bores that have already experienced their uh, decline and flattened out either through, uh, uh, through EOR operations, um, our, our company as well as I'm sure I'm sure the majors are doing a lot of uh, R&D on how you can go back and re-stimulate these wells on an economic basis. Um, so I think in addition to prosecuting the development of all the remaining inventory in places like Permian, there's still a lot left to be proven up on how you can re-enter the well bores and go back into wells and on an economic basis re-stimulate production. And that's before you start dealing with inventory or dealing with innovation on uh, drilling and, and, and completion equipment, which I mentioned in my talk. I guess I'll just add on, Mark, you also mentioned in your prepared comments that some of the producers in the Permian were also private equity. They had high overhead structure. Um, I, I saw a report from one of the big banks that looked at cash flow and segmented the companies by market cap. And you can see you know, companies that were even you know, less than 10 million market cap that were quote unquote companies operating in the Permian that really were struggling. They, they took on so much debt early on and then as you get bigger and bigger, more efficient, more R&D and, and investment in technology, um, the, the, those larger companies are doing better. Maybe I can just comment a little on, on this, um, the ways of, of measuring productivity. is uh, You can measure it in so many ways. You can measure it per well, you can measure it per foot. Uh, uh, actually, we don't see that productivity is falling. We see that productivity, at worst, is, is stagnating uh, a little. Uh, and, and one flaw that we see in many uh, metrics on productivity is that they forget that we are coming from uh, from uh, thousand foot uh, or from one mile wells to two mile wells, and, and one mile well they were actually more productive uh, per foot. Uh, two mile wells they uh, they are less productive in terms per foot, but they are of course much more efficient in terms of capital. And, and productivity. So that's uh, so we have, you always have to dig into the data and try to figure out what are we actually looking at here. Thank you all very much. Uh, hi, Aaron Annable from the Embassy of Canada in Washington. Uh, thanks to all three of you for your remarks. Uh, so in terms of investment, uh, I think we've seen an increased focus uh, on environmental, social, and governance, or ESG principles, both among, among shareholders and the financial communities. So uh, for the companies, uh, how has that affected uh, your corporate decision making? And maybe, Paramagnus, is, is this an area that, that you're paying more attention to as well? Thanks. Go first. I mean, you know, for ExxonMobil, we, we've always tried to do the right thing, regardless of, of who's looking over our shoulder. Uh, but it definitely has been an increase in uh, proposals coming from uh, ESG activists. Uh, you know, and some of those, I think they have the right intent and they're trying to drive the right thing. Uh, but sometimes it, I think it is distracting from, from real progress that can be made. Uh, because some of the... Some of the proposals that would say, well, you know, ExxonMobil, I think you should be divesting and, and getting out. Well, I think you know, the last time I looked, we were like less than 3% of total oil and gas production in the world. And so one of the things we say is, well, hey, don't you think you want someone that's environmentally conscious and, and trying to do the right thing, investing in the, in the supplies that the world is, it will, will be needed, similar to the comments at lunch where you know, the, the operations in Canada being one of the most responsible operators, uh, that, that that's actually a net benefit to the, the oil and gas industry. We've obviously seen a significant increase in uh, focus on ESG in, in, in in not only in our industry, but in all industries. Um, for Pioneer, um, we're, in, we're in a unique position in that we've been focusing on the appropriate management of our footprint for years. Um, the one thing that we, we really haven't done as a company historically, but we are doing uh, much more now, is, is really reporting that out and, and working with the various agencies that are, that are rating the industry uh, on, on ESG performance. The important thing that I'm concerned about is that that doesn't turn into an exercise of checking boxes. 
And, um, and that's really why, as a company, we've really focused on our operations and, and not really focused on our, our, what sort of grade we got. Um, and, and that's why we've been focused on emissions management for years. And, and, and so I would say the difference is we are now uh, really needing to be much more um, outward thinking in how we report what we're doing. Uh, the one thing that we're looking at doing as a company is, is setting targets for our emission reduction as it, as it works out. We've experienced a significant reduction not only in uh, absolute greenhouse gas emissions but also on an intensity basis. Um, but we're now looking at actually setting those targets but not doing it as a top-down exercise. It's an exercise that's really integrated with our drilling and completion operations and our field operations um, so that everyone is focused on the issue. What we found is um, it's incredible what happens when you pe get people focused on something uh, because there's often a lot of things that can be done that either um, actually reduce costs or cost neutral uh, that have a very positive environmental impact. So I'd say the most important part of it is uh, being transparent, reporting it out, but making sure it's not a box checking exercise and that we're actually driving a difference. Per Magnus, anything to add from your perspective on that? I mean, we are working with uh, investors and of course we see this uh, as, uh, as a really uh, top uh, agenda uh, on, the, on the investor side. So uh, the industry just has to do as good as they can, uh, both on, on, on cash, profitability and, uh, and environment. And I think that the industry is doing that. But I'm afraid of, uh, if the investors are pushing the public companies, um, they will uh, maybe reduce the investments and you will see higher oil prices and that will just move the production over to the le, 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 kind of less uh, uh, focused uh, uh, ESC concerned uh, like the national oil companies. Uh, so I, I don't think actually it uh, it serves the purpose uh, really. I think we should have to work with uh, with attitude uh, and uh, less consumption and more efficient uh, consumption. I think that would be more efficient. Thank you all. Uh, I'm Andrew Slaughter with Deloitte. Um, this might be a slightly provocative question, so please forgive me. Um, Mark Berg, you made two comments that I noted. One was that your break-even costs have come down to a really competitive level because essentially you've uh, managed to reduce service costs. And then a couple of minutes later you said the service companies have lost their ability to re uh, innovate and spend money on research. Doesn't the operator community need a healthy service sector to, you know, create progress in this sector? I mean, should returns for service companies are now very low. No, and and and, and that um, that inconsistency didn't didn't uh, wasn't unintentional. It, it it is it is a challenge, uh, and it's something that that really puts pressure on all of us. Um, a lot of what we've done to drive down our break-even costs are not really driving down margin, um, but it's actually working in partnership with our service companies. Um, we have, a, we have a, a very successful partnership when we, we actually used to be in the pressure pumping business ourselves and outsource that uh, at the end of last year. And, uh, and, and we were able to realize a cost reduction from that. But more importantly, we were able to realize a cost reduction because uh, the operator for that for that business now is running more efficiently than we were. And so what we try to do, and I think what the industry needs to do to strive for addressing your point, is uh, compensate uh, for, for recognizing there needs to be a margin for reinvestment. Uh, and, and look for win-win situations where both service companies as well as upstream operators can realize value through efficiency as opposed to just uh, hammering margins. Our industry for years has swung back and forth between service taking it out of upstream and upstream taking it out of service. And what we would rather do is have a fair compensation that incentivizes the, everyone to really drive down costs effectively through efficiency. The other is just through plain innovation. Um, the, uh, per Magnus mentioned the point of increased sand volumes in, in the industry. One of the big stories in the Permian Basin is the huge reduction in sand costs uh, from moving from, in our case, uh, supply in Central Texas, in other cases, supply from, uh, from the Midwest, to in-basin sand in the Permian Basin. 
and there was a substantial amount of capital invested in developing in basin sand um, that has driven down the cost because the mining costs are lower um, and because the delivery costs are lower because it's right next door, it's right in your neighborhood. Um, and again, that's if you look at where Pioneers achieved our biggest cost reductions in the last year, it's because of those two factors. We've knocked off probably $2 million uh, uh, per well in just our sand cost reduction and the efficiencies we've received through our partnership with our, uh, through our service companies. So it's not, I think the more you find larger companies executing on a, uh, on a, uh, a longer term plan uh, where you're trying to have a predictable margin and not swings, I think that partnership will exist and there will have to be a reinvestment of capital, particularly in the pressure pumping business. So we're close to our time, but I see two people at the microphone. So why don't we just t give you both the chance to ask your questions, and then the panel will take them both at once. Wonderful. I'm Mark Agerton. I'm at the University of California, Davis. Um, I noticed a couple of you all talked about productivity in the industry and showed IP rates sort of flattening out. And I'm wondering how much of that do you see being about um, decreasing marginal returns in the production process and sort of maybe you've squeezed as much as you can out of the production process and how much of that is about um, changing where we're drilling in terms of the geological quality of the rock we're accessing either because of depletion or we we drilled bad places to hold them by production. Thank you. Hi. Um, All right, I'll Andrew Dowdy with uh, Engineers Without Borders. Just a quick question. Um, you t what percent of the oil in place are you recovering in general? I know it differs by reservoir. And you alluded to the possibility of EOR. And I'm just sort of curious, are there any comments on anything that might be cooking in that area? Because EOR could really change uh, some numbers here, I believe. Anyway, mm -hmm. thank you. All right. Thank you. So uh, let me, let me uh, ad address the second question first. The, 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 um, oil in place percentages, when you look at the Permian, there's still a substantial, I can't give you the exact percentage, it really depends on the zone and it depends on which basin you're in, but there's still a substantial amount of, of oil in place remaining. Um, there's, there's been um, a fair amount of work done on EOR operations outside of the Permian. I think EOG has had some success in the oil window and the Eagle Ford. Um, and, and they're running, an, I believe, an economic program for EOR. Um, I think all of the larger operators are going to be are going to be studying that issue uh, moving forward, and I do think there's upside potential for that, um, predominantly through huff and puff operations, but also um, there's some there's some thoughts that you could see uh, chemical fracks that would be uh, that could potentially provide stimulation at a much lower cost, but all of that still remains to be tested. In the first question, you want to? Yeah, maybe this um, uh, first question, you know, of course we saw a large uh, impact of high grading uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, I don't think that we see much of that uh, currently. Uh, of course there has been some moving away uh, very recently from Oklahoma, as I showed. Uh, there has been some rigs moving into uh, Delaware, New Mexico, so there is a little impact of that, but uh, I don't think that explains uh, much of the productivity curves uh, as we speak uh, today. Mm -hmm. I, I would say in the Permian, um, where you see diminishing marginal return, returns on, on production increases, I just think it's, it's companies getting up on the learning curve, both in terms of completion designs in, in the various zones that they're operating in, as well as uh, downspacing practices and uh, getting into understanding the impact of uh, parent-child well relationships and uh, what's the optimal uh, pattern both vertically and horizontally for developing a multi-basin play. And, and, and I, I, don't, I don't see it as a negative. Uh, I see it as a maturation. Um, uh, but we, for example, Pioneer still this year saw um, while we don't run the company off of anywhere near IP rates, um, we did see improvements. Um, it just wasn't the same significance of improvements because um, we're much further down the learning curve. Um, but still, you know, our, our, our first six to nine months of, 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 uh, of production were still showing improvements off of our program last year. A lot of what you're seeing now is uh, companies focusing on what's the best 
methodology for uh, for uh, developing multi-well pads on multiple zones and bringing those on, timing and spacing as well as completion design. So I think you'll still see, see some improvements, but the learning curve is, we're up on the learning curve. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, so we've had a, a great conversation here. Thank you all for your time and attention and for your questions in the conversation. Um, yeah, I think, you know, what I came away with was that, um, you know, this there's still scope for significant requirements of investment in oil and gas in under any future scenario, including a successful transition to a low carbon future. Um, there are st plenty of opportunities, um, and uh, what I came away with was thinking that it kind of has, while this is always at its heart a cyclical business, um, you know, there's significant scope for, uh, for, for the continued development of these resources. Um, I'm conscious of the fact that it's only me between you and coffee, so please let me wrap up and join me in thanking our panelists for a great discussion, Mark, Chris, Paramagnus. Magnus.